You are watching Econoom TV, the unofficial broadcaster of economics for South African students. In today's episode, we are looking at Chapter 7. It's about demand, supply and prices. This is Part 4 of 4, and we are focusing on demand and supply in action and how prices are determined. When we talk about market equilibrium, equilibrium means that the demand equals the supply, and this leads to the determination of an equilibrium price, PE, and equilibrium quantity, QE. It's possible that at a specific price there may be an excess demand, that at that price the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. Or the other way around, at a specific price there could be an excess supply, that at the price the quantity demanded is smaller than the quantity supplied. All of this is easy to show in a simple graph. We are still with the tomatoes example and here you can see the familiar demand and supply curves. When you put them together, their interaction yields a point where they are equal. At this equilibrium point, the equilibrium price is determined as 5 rands per kilo of tomato and the quantity sold or traded is 200 kilograms of tomatoes. To reach this equilibrium, you should think about an informal market where you can go and argue with the seller until you reach a price where you can transact a specific quantity of whatever you're buying and he or she is selling. To illustrate this interaction of demand and supply, it's possible to start with a specific price and then show what happens. For example, if we should start with a price of 7 rands per kilo of tomatoes, you would have an excess supply to start with. At 7 rands, the consumers are willing to buy only 120 kilos of tomatoes. The suppliers, on the other hand, would offer 300 kilos. Now, at this point, there will be a lot of tomatoes not being sold and being spoiled at the market. The suppliers will then reduce the price bit by bit to increase the quantity that is sold. As the price is decreased from the supplier side, the consumers will demand an increasing quantity. According to the law of demand that says, as the price decreases, the quantity demanded increases. This process continues until demand equals supply at the equilibrium point. You can make a similar story starting at a low price. If the price of tomatoes were 2 rands a kilo, the suppliers would only offer 50 kilos of tomatoes. The consumers, on the other hand, would be willing to buy a lot of them. They will buy 320 kilograms at a price of 2 rand. If this happens, there will be a scarcity of tomatoes. Very little is offered, only a quantity of 50 kilos, and a lot of people are willing to buy. The result is that the price will slowly get pushed up by the consumers and their excess demand. As this happens, the suppliers will react and they will realize, but people are willing to pay for this. And at the higher prices, they will increase the quantity supplied. This process of pushing up the price due to scarcity and the suppliers steadily increasing the supply will continue until the equilibrium price is reached. At point E, Demand is equal to supply and the equilibrium price is 5 rands a kilo with the quantity being sold 200 kilos. Prices serve a very important function in the market economy. It serves as a signal to buyers and sellers about what is happening in the market. For example, a very high price would serve a rationing function. If something is extremely scarce, it's also likely to be highly priced and at this high price, people will use a specific resource very carefully. Rationing is one part of the story. The other is allocation. Prices tell consumers and firms how to allocate resources. For example, in the production process, labor could become more expensive. When it's more expensive relative to capital, that will lead to an allocation of scarce resources in such a way that production becomes more capital intensive. Another example is to say that some types of jobs have really high salaries and they attract people who want to earn those salaries. 
This is an allocation function. Those jobs typically have, require sort of very sophisticated skills and in the end draw the best people in the field. In this way, resources are allocated efficiently where they are needed. Once you've established the market price, it's possible to talk about the ideas of consumer and producer surplus. The consumer surplus is up first. At the market price, in this case P1, a quantity of Q1 is being traded. But at this price, consumers are experiencing a surplus because they were in fact willing to pay more for smaller quantities of this product. For example, they were willing to pay a much higher price for much fewer units of the product, but they don't need to. At the market price, they actually buy at a lower price and a greater quantity. An example of this is water. Municipal water from the tap is very competitively priced and we all pay and use water happily. But if water were to be scarce, we would be willing to pay much more for it and consume much less than we do at the moment. Thus, at the market price, there is a substantial consumer surplus where we get to buy a product that is worth much more to us than the market price indicates. A similar story is true for the producers. The producers may have been willing to actually sell fewer units of the product at a lower price than the market price dictated in the end. So consumers were willing to take a lower price for a smaller quantity of the product, but they don't need to. The market price has been set at P1 and they are able to sell Q1. This triangle indicates the producer surplus. When you put it together, it's clear that when the market functions well, there's never a case of the consumers only being ripped off by the producers or the producers suffering while they sell to the consumers. At the market price, both were willing to transact and the consumers were getting some surplus. They were willing to pay more for fewer units of the product and the producers are getting some surplus. They were willing to sell less at a lower price, but neither of them need to do this. They can transact at the market price, P1, and buy and sell the quantity, Q1. Finally, we're going to have a look at some examples of the interaction of demand and supply and what that means for the equilibrium price and quantity. The first one says, suppose that a heavy frost destroys part of the Brazilian coffee harvest. What's going to happen in the market? Now, we know that a natural disaster like that typically limits production capacity and the result is that the supply moves to the left. Less coffee will be supplied at every price. The end result is that the equilibrium price will increase and the equilibrium quantity will decrease. A different possibility is that lab experiments on mice shows that coffee causes cancer. This is bound to shock the consumers and the result would be that the preference for coffee would decrease. Less coffee will be demanded at every price and the demand curve will move to the left. The result of this will be a decrease in the equilibrium price and also a decrease in the equilibrium quantity. It's possible to ask, what will happen if the price of tea falls sharply? Now, coffee and tea are typically substitutes in consumption, and we can quickly draw the market for tea on this side. Quantity, price, and the demand for tea, with some initial combination of price and quantity demanded. If the price of tea was to fall sharply, the result will be an increase in the quantity of tea being demanded. Now, if more, more people drink more tea, the result would be that they will be drinking less coffee and the whole demand curve for coffee will move to the left. Less coffee will be asked at every price. The end result in the market for coffee is a decrease in the equilibrium price and a decrease in the equilibrium quantity. Finally, let's say that workers in the coffee industry start a union and negotiate higher wages. We know that such an increase in the cost of inputs will increase the cost of production. 
The result of that is that less will be supplied at every price. The whole supply curve will move to the right. The end result of this will be an increase in the equilibrium price and a decrease in the equilibrium quantity. So did we achieve the outcomes of this section? Can you explain how the equilibrium price and quantity are determined and show changes on a graph? Can you distinguish between consumer and producer surplus? You can also have a look at Chapter 7 in Moor and Furi, and there are additional resources available on Yefuni. Answer the quiz questions, and finally, follow at Econoom on Twitter.